one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to PlungeCast. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we just finished up with the Incredible uh, Chat uh, with the, uh, with the um, Kickstarter campaign. We we had if you have missed if you missed that one, jump in and uh, check out our site um, PlungeCast on YouTube later, and um, you'll be able to see that awesome little a lot of information about how to run a campaign from people who have actually spent ten years doing it. And so, and people who are in the industry, in the comic book industry. Now, today I have amazing guests with me, close friends, and someone who was who's been at the start of what we got started with Plunge and stuff, uh, and and from right uh, about 2018 when I rocked up to the opening of Northern uh, Northern uh, Art Center in from Ray. It was a cold April night, if I remember right. I think it was the 29th, and yeah. I um I walked in for this. First time, you know, um, really cool thing that was happening with airbrush and stuff. And outside, I went for I was smoker at that time. I've given up smoking for a year and a half now. I feel really good. I get to spend that money on toys, right? I get to spend it on toys and comic books now. So something more long lasting than air, you know, smoke going away and my health getting better. But one of the cool things about that is that we were able to network. And here we are. Uh, working, um, you know, over those five on years, making friendships, the community uh, benefiting from that, the amazing stuff that's worked through um, these these two friends of ours, uh, especially Julia Tapp, uh, working with, um, I guess, in the sense of special needs, um, young ones and older ones in the community, yeah. and also using art as a way to, you know, get kids involved in um, something more creative. And I'm going to let Juliet introduce herself now yeah. and, you know, and also Zoe and we'll talk to them afterwards. Okay, awesome. Hi, uh, my name's Julia and this one here is Zoe. Hello. <laughs> um, I am an airbrush artist, but I'm also a community worker. Um, I um, help out with doing respite for um, neurodivergence, uh, special needs as well, or mainly teenagers struggling with depression that need essentially an emergency art space, as bizarre as that sounds. <laughs> it is a needed, needed thing in the community. And Zoe here, my daughter, has been working alongside me for the last, gosh, at least six, seven years. Um, uh, helping out with all sorts around the community. So I'm sure you've got heaps of questions for us. And um, would you like to introduce yourself and then we'll see sure. where Aru goes from there. So <laughs> hello, I'm Zoe. I work with Julia, like she says, in the art centre, working with respite and mental health and all that. I also do teaching for young kids within the community, helping put out affordable art lessons so that they can have an opportunity to learn. Um, and I also do traditional and digital art and I teach that to them and I do all that and I really enjoy it. She's Photoshop lady and I'm yeah. the traditional side. Awesome. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Like it's kind of like the, you know, the new tech and the old tech, you know, you've yeah. got people, draw it's, it's, I, 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 for me, I like I like to encourage both now. Like you know, I like to encourage uh, yeah. the traditional. Make sure you got your traditional down, and then go with your um, your digital because that way you're not shortcutting to to, um, to digital because sometimes you miss out a lot if you just jump yeah. to um, digital without learning the traditional. And I think the great thing is now you have because with you know with the the, the digital you have so many shortcut uh, software applications that you can use to actually not learn as much. Like I can basically get figure like, uh, you know, 3D images and I can chuck it up there and I can just draw around that and that's me done, right? And like yeah. without even knowing anything about proportions, how, you know, what size the head's got to be compared to the arms, compared to the body. And and so with your, um, with the, um, the school that you've been teaching, how do you go about, teaching someone who's like come, maybe come out of like digital and go okay now we need to you know how do we get them to focus on traditional learning about like actually get back to the basics how do you do that with these guys 
Did you want to talk to them about your students or should sure. I go first? Because we have very different teaching methods. Yes, yeah, you can go first. <laughs> if you want. I can go first. Okay, so I mostly teach the airbrush classes, whereas Zoe teaches a lot of the uh, younger kids and the teenagers. So for our classes, um, they're developed by Tony Vells by Airbrush Venturi, but you were taught a systematic lot of scales, so say eight different strokes, and then those are measured by percentage values. So it's exact and direct rendering. So you're taught to break down photographs and images and know exactly what stroke to know, how, how high from the canvas with how much opacity and a certain percentage focal tone. Mm. So that one is very measured, very much like a builder's plan. And that takes mm. care of a lot of the people that they don't really do left and right brain dominant now, but the left brain thinkers that were more math based and people that mm. go i have no art skills can learn through that method whereas the other method which we teach and zoe specializes in is more like a block method so i'll let zoe um chat about yeah, sure. about how you so, do it with the way i teach is i allow both traditional and digital in my class because i think that they're both very good forms of art mm -hmm. and when I am transferring digital to traditional what I do is I will take what they already know or I'll have a look and I'll teach them how to actually break down what they're looking at because mm -hmm. what we find is these people are really good with copying and also a lot of the brushes and the models are preset so they're very good at right. copying them. so what I do is I help them break it down and learn sort of art fundamentals to understand what they're seeing, like balance, composition, proportion, form, tone, all of those things that you're taught in traditional art that you may not learn in digital. It's like going back to those little wooden mannequins, essentially. Yeah. Yep. So we might even use a 3D model as a sort of a starting point, And then we show them how to break that down on paper and measure it and not to trace those models, but to look at them and understand how they work. Or, or right. even a stick figure, which is interesting, because yeah. a lot of traditional and digital art just starts with a simple simple stick figure. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think seeing that common ground there and building up from, well, you can't get more basic than a stick figure, I hope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you gotta, you got to get the angles, you know, the poses, and, and you go from there. I think yeah. the, the great thing about like having, tr for me, traditional, right? Like having the traditional thing, it's, ex it's tactile. You can touch it. You can, you know, you can put your hand on it. You can pass it on. Of course you can do that digitally, but like it's actually physical thing there. Like, you know, it's here. Right. And I yeah. think um, by, I think be, now that we're able to have amazing printers that we can actually get digital artwork printed out, canvases and stuff, we're able to do that as well, just that, rather than just being on paper. So have you guys looked at actually, the you know, like say we've got the airbrush artwork there um, behind you. Have you looked at actually maybe looking at that, getting digitized and then printing that out as like, you know, other forms of like, um, you know, merch, like they like maybe like get on a pillow or get it on like a you know a postcard or a wall hanging something like that because yeah, so you know, it's going it's going from traditional to like you know going from traditional going to digital and then going back to traditional yeah so quite often after the traditional artwork is done photos are taken and then at the events because we do a lot of market stalls and things too um we'll have tables with prints on or things like oh you can't see them that way wrap think on the back of my shirt so you print them onto t-shirts handbags we've done all sorts that sort of thing which is pretty cool um but that's more like a cash and carry range um yeah, yeah but yeah. whereas i want to learn more about digital and i look at zoe's work i go how do you do that she's doing yeah. the same at, at me so we're in this weird generational gap where yeah. we're just going to teach each other <laughs> yeah but that's the cool thing about that isn't it like um you know having mom and mom and daughter there teaching together yet doing different forms of 
um, tutorials to students of all ages. What are you, yeah, talk about, you know, what ages are your students that you um, teach there? Did you want to do yours first? So my students, I teach a group of tweens and I find that they are a very digital focused generation and mm. they're very obsessed with anime and cartoons. And so what I've been doing is I've been taking things that they're used to and that they enjoy and I've been like trying to get them to do it traditionally or explore with it or stuff like that so that they get a broader sort of uh, skill set and I'm still mm. teaching it through these sort of cartoon things because that's what I've found is they just enjoy it the most being children yeah. and they're really responding to it well and there's still stuff yeah. to be learnt through stuff like cartoons manga like they're mm. artists with jobs and big industries they're good artists yeah. Yeah. plus it's a more enjoyable isn't it like to do the animated style of work as well or when you're like you know, because I think um, for me personally, I, I, I like looking at that. I watch anime all the time. And I think uh, it's the visual the visual element of um, cartoons and animation has this real creative, uh, enjoyable beauty to it that like traditional um, animation kind of doesn't. It becomes more serious. And so when you have something like anime, that can be very serious sometimes, you know, like, like ReZero is like one of the most brutal you know uh series is out there but then you have something like you know pokemon right and then you have something like uh dr stone you know which is a bit more you know a bit more educational in the sense you know how to survive a friggin apocalypse you know how do you survive the end of the world and how do you make soap you know and how do you uh you know how do you make wi-fi or talk walkie talkies in a world that has lost all technology and i think this is a like when you're watching something like that and then you get to draw some you know some form of your own art style based on those characters because you love those characters i think it, there's a lot of um joy that comes with it you know like imagine like you, you're growing up watching mickey and mickey mouse and now you're drawing mickey learning how to draw mickey mouse you know um yeah. do you have any like students who actually like ha um have been able to bring what they've loved and actually bring their own style into that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course, we, um, we actually do fun art challenges. So, like, one That's of the art challenges was to draw themselves or their own characters in a style of something they enjoyed, like a show, a book, a movie, it mm. could be anything. And I teach like that because it's still teaching them to observe and to just pay attention to how things work within other things in the art. And it's really good. Right. They have a lot of fun. And we do color palette challenges and just, it's really engaging artwork in a way of teaching. The, the challenge okay. I like that she does um, actually throws a spanner in the work because I'm, right. I'm a, a different type of teacher and I tend to go, right, let's, let's, let's see what they can handle. And Zoe has mm -hmm. this cool challenge where there are like four or five different options for gender, height, weight, yeah. um, hobbies, activities, and the students have to pick a random number and create a character that is to that. So in that sense, the girl, which is always like, I'm just talking stereotypically, if someone is always drawing fairies and dream catchers, yeah. they might end up with a angry dwarf who lives in a flower or something and... And so yeah. they have to do outside of their thinking as well, because that's a huge part of being an artist as well, is, is it's wonderful to do what you like and what your passion is, but mm. there's a huge amount of skill in it, by being able to bring other people's creations to life or something unexpected. Yeah. Doing commissions, you often have to work outside of your comfort zone. Yeah, you have to try new yeah. stuff because the client wants something you've never done before or not often and you're like well guess i gotta learn it and you're yeah. not truly challenging yourself if you're always doing the same yeah. the same things so you get stuck in mm. loops so um how how many students do you guys teach at any given time so usually classes are about six to seven max so they're yeah. only tiny 
Um, we did used to have a shop in town, but during COVID and all that drama, we decided to downscale and buy our own studio. So we operate just out of Portland. Zoe has seven a week in one class, plus another class of about, I think there's another seven in that class too. Um, we're looking at opening a third class shortly. Um, I have 10 airbrush students and I have three respite students regularly stay overnight on average um, each week. Um, we've got one here at the moment who's been here about, what, a week? Two weeks, he's just told me. <laughs> um, and we're helping him with a bit of a life crisis and he'll be moving on shortly. So um, it, it's the halfway house of arts here. <laughs> I think I mean like I remember when I was when I moved like I've I've lived with everybody like people all my life right I moved out of home when I was like about sixteen going on seventeen and yeah. um, that was like about thirty or thirty odd years ago thirty four years ago and um, I remember ever since then like I left my family and I flatted and rented and boarded and you know with all sorts of people over that time so. Eight years, like five years ago, for the first time, I started living alone. And the first night was the scariest night when I realized that I am now alone. And I remember, like, um, I said to my sister, can you come over? Because yeah, there's so much silence. Like, I had, where I, before, like the five years before, I had kids running around the house making, you know, noises and stuff, and I had silence. My sister said to me, right, she said, um, you need to sort out what it is you want to do you know and what brings you joy and i think one thing i thought was like it's it's art it's music you know and i think a lot of times we've forgotten what art and music actually can do for us right and i think uh, yeah. it it can provide art can provide an imagination to get out of our head uh music can bring take us to an emotional point and i think for me personally, like uh, you know, uh, because it was quite depressing, and I and I and I, I had to figure out, and I had to go, yes, this is this is what is gonna what makes me happy, right? The two things that make me happy. I think there was a third one as well, but like there was two things that really made me happy, and yeah. uh, you know, and I found like we've lost that over time. We've said that art isn't that important, that um, that it doesn't allow like getting. You know, getting doodling on paper, getting our thoughts out, and dr just messing around isn't that important anymore. And I think somehow we lost that because when we were growing up, it was like you doodle all you want. You know, sit in class and you doodle, and nobody cared. And suddenly, somewhere along there, somebody said, "No, you shouldn't be doodling. You should be paying attention." You know, whereas because not all of us think uh, the same way, we're not all of us get educated the same way. Because a lot of us are visual, and I'm very visual. I can't. Technical stuff, I just can't get it. But if you show me visually what it is, I'll get it. So, yeah, you know, you've got students now coming to you uh, who, you know, from all sort of backgrounds. How do you, like, try to get them to a stage where you're able to talk to them, you know, to be able to manage them into their own sort of thing um, it, at that special place? Into the trust and things like that, do you mean? Hmm. Because right, not so, only that, but like because you're an uh, your teacher, right? They're coming to you yeah. and they're going, "This is what I've been thinking all this time." And then you go, "Well, how you know? Have you thought about this? And how do you get them to build, like you said, build that trust?" And because you're strangers, right, to them, and they're strangers to you, and art is the only thing that's your your you know your your road or your path to each other. How do you bring? their path um get you both on the same path with them so i think most of the time if it's not a um instructed and delivered course if we're left to take things naturally which is one of the other services we offer i suppose is a way of putting it um the first session we actually do mostly a sit down session now we have a very unique approach i'm not there to diagnose anyone i'm not there to offer art therapy no. We actually just make a coffee or hot chocolate. We don't feed the kids up on coffee. And we sit beside them and we focus on the arts. Now, there is actual scientific proof 
that after 40 minutes of doing art, music, dance, anything creatively related will release dopamine and serotonin in your brain. So, I mean, there is a whole chemistry paper and art therapists know more about it than I do. But throughout our healing, because we opened after we'd lost a three-year-old in a mm. tragic accident, we found that we healed ourselves through doing arts along with the community. So yeah. restoring those good brain chemicals. So, so I took that. I'm probably wrong, but I took that as meaning art heals. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. through not being there, like we are not a public organization. We're a private organization. We're also mm -hmm. a registered charity. Um, but we tend to work because we're not there to grade the person or figure out why they're using the red crayon or whatever. You'll find more natural conversations come up because we're just yeah. private people there to guide and coach through the art process. And often we've had things that students have said to us, and we have spoken to the parents briefly about it later. This is younger students. Mm -hmm. And they're like, wow, they never tell anybody that. Or, yeah. you know, it's um, providing a safe space and atmosphere where they're not being mm -hmm. graded and judged. For the other ones on the courses, they're being graded and judged. <laughs> it's like two people just hanging out, doing art in a comfortable space yeah. and just talking about whatever's on their mind. It's very casual. And those mm. lessons too, they can do what they want. They say, hey, I want to learn to do this. Or we had one girl painted a beautiful painting and mm. then she covered it in black paint and started scratching through it and scratched rage into the canvas and yeah. we were like, oh, that sucks to see that beautiful artwork go. Mm. But she's just taken her rage out onto that canvas and still portrayed her emotion. So mm. that there was really cathartic, really healing for her. She, she might have needed to destroy something beautiful to get out that expression. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's nice when they don't do that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think or, or, that's a great thing about art, isn't it? Like we're able to put it on paper. You know, we're not able to put it out onto physically into other people that rage. And I think where where people haven't because they haven't learned to put it on paper or in art or in music, and they've put it out physically. You know, that's where we get all this chaos from, and in our culture, I, I um. Personally, you know, right, talking about that, I like, I mean, I remember I wrote, I did a feature film and um, in that film, I had, I got my rage out, right? And I, I got, I got what I felt out. I was, I felt so much better afterwards. It's like, yeah, it's out, you know, yeah. and um, I made it in the, in the fantasy sort of setting, a drama, thriller, whatever, crime, I got it out and I was able to carry on, you know, and I think a lot of times people hold on and I think um, I, um, things like art and music and dance and performance, there's, there's things there's, we kind of like, we enjoy in life and we know a lot about but we still don't appreciate enough of the, like you saw, hit the healing side of it and the emotional uh, healing that comes through those expressions we and, kind and of like part of it, like mm -hmm. art in particular, music, you can feel it. And certainly, like, your musicians let it out when you see their performances, a really heartfelt performance. Mm. Art, if you need to, you can screw it up. You can feel it. You can make it soft. You can rip it with a knife. It's, set it on fire. You can set it on fire. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> You can't do that with digital art unless you print it first. No. Um, yeah. But I suppose, like, even digital art, art would have those healing benefits, though, because it's brain mm. chemistry when you're using those parts of your brain lighting up. No, it does make yeah. art very accessible for people who can't afford paper or paint. I did. Yeah, exactly. Everyone has a phone these days. Yeah. So everyone... a... yeah, yeah, that's true. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you true. could, um, you know, you could, you could um, just go online and read a comic book without having to, you know, go into a shop and pay for it or something, 
but also, you know, in, in return, you could actually buy those pages off online as a digital download as a PDF. And uh, or you can yeah. you know, share it and stuff. And I think that, that uh, just like we're doing here, technology has made it so much easier for us to be able to, you know, um, share our feelings out into the world. Um, and, uh, and I think sometimes, you know, I think like because like this, you know, where like people are out there, you know, you don't know who's out there on the other end. And so like when you have someone like yourself actually physically there in the community, people can, you know, bring kids and go, yep, I know this person. I know this person will look after my child and, you know, will teach them art and will be able to communicate in a way, you know, they're registered, they're tr trusted by the community, they've got it, all this stuff. And, you know, they're not going to have to worry about it. And so I think that aspect of uh, having a place like yourselves, uh, and you've been at it for five years now, like five and a half years almost. And yeah, I think the yeah. community, and you know. It's been really the, beautiful to offer it in the community too because, like, you were just talking about different teaching styles and stuff. Mm. I remember one lesson we had a student who would go under the desk and the parent was telling them that, they were being bad climbing under the table and to come out for the lesson. You know yeah. what? It's way easier just to put a, a teacher down there too. And like yeah. by the end of the session, they had done some beautiful work and he sat up at the table every day for the next term, which was mm -hmm. which was cool. But like both of us were the weird Asperger's kid that sat in the corner. So yeah. Um, yeah well, that's it reminds <laughs> it reminds me of HR, HR Geiger, right? Like, you know, when he was young, when he was doing his art. Like, he, this is a guy who, who did all the really uh, famous aliens creature designs, right? Uh, yeah. And so he used to, like, put a blanket over his head and draw, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. And um, and you saw all this beautiful art come out. That, like, to be honest, that it's, it's, it's a monstrous beauty. It isn't a cuddly toy beauty. You know, or you know, yeah. anime or cartoon, but it is beauty, and it is, uh, and that's the thing about art. I think I love. I think you yeah. can have, um, you know, you can have something like this, right? Um, this is by Shane, you know, Shane, Shane Evans, our a um, local artist, um, art of Evan, Adams, um, Evans, right? So we've got Judge Death yeah. here from our favorite, well, mine and his favorite, uh, 2080 comic books, right? So that's the opposite kind of like opposite of Judge uh, Dread, right? Everybody knows Carl Urban and Dread 3D movie, you know, our local, you know. Uh, um, he does great art too, by the way. Yeah. I mean, like, he's brilliant, right? So, I mean, so you can have something cute and cuddly, right? You know, superhero oriented, but you can also have something like this, you know, creepy looking, yet still the line work and everything shows you um the you know, it's not everybody uh what is that called you know not not everybody enjoys the same art you know and finds the same sort of passion for the same art like i love i love horror movies and stuff but doesn't mean i'm going to consume every single moment of every single day horror movies because i'm going to yeah. get tired of it so i'll turn off i'll watch one a, a, a week and then i'll go and watch tons of animated you know anime or cartoons and stuff like that or i'll go and watch um you know a tv show like recently i went i've been watching like a cold warrior i get to learn about the asian chinese over in america in the 1800s right and that culture and how you know what was going on with that and i think having entertainment so accessible through mediums like tv animation uh art books literature it's made us so, uh, I think sometimes it makes us um, blasé about art. Like, you know, you can go, well, if somebody once said to me, oh, is comics a good, you know, is, it, is comics such a big deal? And like, you realize there's a billion dollar movie just came out, yeah, right? Based on a comic book character that was created in the 60s, you know, Spider-Man. And, um, you know, and, and through that one character being created 60 odd years ago by two people, I think it was Steve Ditko and uh, Stan Lee, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, Steve Ditko is the guy who actually designed the character 
to what you know to what we know him as and um 60 odd years of people benefiting from those stories kids growing up on it i've got toys and you know toys I've got, yeah. you know i've got i've got a, a bed sheet covering a mattress there with spider-man yeah. hanging on it right you know and all the that business element yeah there's a business element to creating art you know and we talked i talked about earlier about how you get into from like actual just doing traditional to getting into like getting on bags and t-shirts and stuff but there is a whole economy behind this piece of art that we create and i think it's become so accessible that sometimes i feel people are blasé about what's there you know the mass production side of it people you know yeah and i like the fact that you as a traditional artist are doing one-off pieces as well right you know and you're able to not only be a teacher and you know got zoe, zoe there doing, um, teaching digital which can be manufactured over and over and over and over into whatever but like not only that you can also turn that into traditional by actually saying, okay let's put on some canvas let's put on some you know backpacks let's do a patch of it and yeah. now it becomes um such a that one single piece can create economy around it and i think people don't realize that like all these students that are coming that they can find something career in it you know one or two might decide to stick with it and i think a yeah. lot of times parents parents like they still there's still parents who don't understand that art can be a career you know and that art can, can be something really you need that cash and carry range as well as the originals range though so like this one you probably can't see it too well behind me at the moment it's for a hot rod show um the original will be being sold to the models family we've already agreed on that um mm -hmm. there you go miss twisted she's a beautiful model from auckland uh, a twisted scarlet that was it and um we'll be releasing prints of that i might make that one a bedspread That'd be cool, eh? Like, there's great places like, um, who is it overseas? There's, there's got to be local ones too, but the ones like, is it Vistaprint and Snapfish? They can do yeah, things you, pretty yeah. cheap. You put it on stuff that people use or would buy as a gift and make it affordable because not yeah. everyone's going to pay the price that artwork is worth. So you yeah. give them something like prints and products. Yeah. Yeah. There is print on demand, right? Like, this, I think it's printful yeah. and we can yeah. put on clothes people can buy on demand rather whereas like i was looking at that last year and thinking about it and how you could basically uh get you know people could buy your art and it'll get made and ordered on demand and sent to them when they, you know when they on you know when they get in the cart and pay the bill and it'll get to them when on time and so on i think this is the great way to, um that especially with the young ones right now right technology they can learn so quickly from what has been um, taught from business sense yeah. because of all you know that you guys are like yeah there's a digital aspect but now you've got a piece of work what are you going to do with it you know yeah correct correct i think i'm relying or i'm hoping that people are going to keep valuing the human touch on artworks yeah. um as ai yeah. art is coming more and more in and more popular yeah. um which is yeah. a whole different thread in itself um you know, a few of my artist friends said, oh, that means we have to lower our prices. And I'm no. like, hang on, why does that mean you have to lower your prices? You're doing a service which is mm. hand done. That's a computer. If right. anything, it's caused, to it's caused to maintain your prices and yep. uphold that traditional industry. Yeah, I mean, I've talked, I've talked to a few people about AI art in the past, and um, I think it, it's a machine. You know, a machine who t which takes all the creators' works that's ever been created out into this machine, chews it up, and puts out a version of all their work in that style, but it's not real. Yeah, all, all it's yeah. doing is copying humans, right? It's just it's all it's doing is taking human work and saying, "Here's a new version, a robot, you know, a digital version of what that would look like." if it was yeah. all chewed up and spit out like this. So it's like a, it's like a stew. That's basically what it is, a stew. You know, it's yeah. not. Uh, it is, yeah. 
Yeah, it's I not have gourmet. a slightly <laughs> popular opinion on digital art. <laughs> Zoe and I yeah. slightly disagree on some of it too. And mm. I, when I heard about it and people were, you know, knocking it and dragging it down on the internet, which I understand, mm. um, on the other hand, as an artist, I went, awesome. I can now type in all my keywords and get vomited back out at me like six or eight different variations of of templates yeah. where I can go, I like that bit there and that bit there yeah. and that bit there, and then use that for inspiration. Instead of having to design those eight myself, I can right. already see it and I can take what I like from each one to create what I like. So I think mm -hmm. as a, if you use it as a tool, it's a great thing. It's, yeah, the thing yeah. I don't but, like about it is steals art that's, Art's going to get stolen if you post it on the internet. So oh, yeah. It's a bit of a grey area. Yeah, we, we yeah, can I mean, try anything our best. you put out. Wasn't it? Picasso said, steal it like an artist. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's well, one I mean, of like his we've, quotes. But we've always got an inspiration from other people's work. This is just a digital version of yeah. that. I think um, yeah. I, had, I had a go myself, right, as a writer. So sometimes I like... Um, I don't actually, I let, because I work with several artists, I, um, I know what their uh, style is. So I don't tend to, uh, I just go, this is like, cut, I, I do collages. That's how I work with my artists. I do collages and I'll put a little instructions of the, the look, like I'll say, that boot needs to be like this. So I'll get a picture of a boot. I'll stick it to the, the collage person. The jacket will look like this. Uh, this is the face of what I want her, the character to look like. She'll have dreads, the other one won't, and so on. This is how the, the colors scheme will be. And we've done this with, recently with the uh, Templeton twins, right, where they're, they're twins, but they're opposites of each other. One's goth, one isn't. One's like a summer dress wearing thing. One's the other one's like goth boots, you know, a black hoodie and so on. And the other one's, you know, got light. So the way I was doing that, I was like, I just got a whole bunch of pictures and I collaged it. Now, you could say, okay, if I, go, I put it into AI and I same things, I go, well, this one's got to be like this. It will give me something, but it will it'll also force my artist to do it the way Dad has done it because he'll see the style now. It's not letting him, yeah. letting the artist use their imagination of trying to, I'll, I'll get, you know, I'll have a whole bunch of instructions as well, but I have the pictures there and I'll let, him, let that artist go for it. And I see the beauty when they come back to me in like 2D pencil work or ink work. And I go, wow, you know, it's so much better than what I could have done and what machine could have done because there's this human element to it that, yeah. that machines totally miss out on. You make the final decision at the end of the day on what goes in mm. that artwork. Well, it's very yeah. common concept artists to photo bash, which is taking yeah. real photos and incorporating them in their artworks and painting over top. Right. Oh, true. And that's, that, yeah. 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 I mean, background work and stuff. I, I, I've got one that's like that as well. Like we've got actually got a back. Uh, we've got, one of our young artists did a cover for us, and um, you know, the background is like you can see it. It's like it's a photo and it looks beautiful just the way they've done it. It's like out of focus and looks amazing. Where she's done treaty, um, like two D art, um, anime art on top, but like just the background. And I think that's the same with you know with animation. You see, like, we've done for years, like, the background's like, you know, when you see the Westerns, right? There's, like, a there's a screen that moves, and there's a horse running in front of it, right? And there's just a screen that moves. And so this is yeah. like something new, you know, using that, you know, photo bash element. But the other thing I was thinking, like, like as a writer, I'd, I'd, I have a story, that, a short story idea I did write. So I want to see how, uh, I think it was Chat GBT or something like that, would work and write a script according to what I put in from my original idea. So I did about three different versions and I could see every time I changed it and I thought, okay, let's try this, you know, 15 pages or 12 page story about this and about this. This is the main character. This is this, this is this. And this is what happens. Uh, you know, my plot lines that I, when I, when I'm trying to come up with a story, what's this, uh, what's the idea behind it? What plot elements will happen? What will be the final thing? What would be the start of it? What's in the middle? You know, um, so yeah. I used it and I went, it's it's really great because the reason it gave me what it gave me, it gave me 
the Hollywood standard version of what cookie cutter stories are like now. And we have been become used to. It was totally cookie colored, cut it, right? Yeah. This the story was like, okay, this happens, this happens, this happens. And I'm like, now, okay, great. That's cool. But now I need to bring something from my own emotion into it. Because otherwise yeah. there's nothing there. It's just cookie cutter. And I think this is what like the great thing about AI, it can do that. Give us the steps, uh, shortcut yep. the steps, basically. It's just a shortcut, right? But at yep. the end of the day, we can go away and put our own self into it, our emotions into it. So I think that's a good side of AI. The bad side is that stealing art, you know, stealing other people's yep. uh, ideas, um, people who are actually really, really famous as actual proper artists are now being told that they're, de they are like a AI artist, right? Because the art has been stolen so many times through AI that like their yeah. own original artists, digital artists, or even traditional artists are not being fairly treated on their own traditional work. And I think that's yeah. kind of, that's the third part of it. That's the downside of that. I think too, that's where I was saying, like, I think I'd only ever really use it for inspiration per yeah personally like I don't think it's something that people should really go and and create this out on and then print that off yeah. as prints yeah. and sell them that's you can almost always tell though because it can only create from what already exists so there is nothing yeah. new so if you have a look you can see parts in the AI artwork that are present in other artists and artworks and yeah. as they do things and that's how you tell yeah because it doesn't create anything new yeah it's just a mashup it won't, it won't be long before it is created yeah well yeah new, <laughs> yeah it won't be you know it's always a case like it's like it's only time you know only time will you know bring more technology to the head where we won't be able to know who is who and what's what and i think that's my yeah. fear it's like it's like when uh, when you can't tell what an original piece of artwork is compared to what is a ai created artwork by the same artist right and you go, well, someone's basically taken someone's work and is now making money off a traditional artist's work who spent their entire, you know, learning life becoming this quality artwork. But now somebody can just go, oh, yeah, I'm going to put it in. Here you go. Same price. You know? yeah, yeah. Or even cheaper. I think that's the, that's the sad part of it. It's where it makes it so easy that the value of appreciating art has dropped um and i think uh you know i would you know having something you know created by a proper you know i mean not proper artist but an artist that you know that you can hold and you can see the strokes and the yeah. you know the pen pen strokes the felt marks whatever and it's yeah. it's actually there it's never going to be able to compete with, with the same That's emotional right. thing with a with a computer you know someone had the same value to it yeah, I, I agree with you. Now, um, let's talk about some copy, like copywriting, because we're talking about AI and stuff. And um, because you guys work at markets and you do like um, face painting, you do, uh, thoughts, you know, yeah. pop art and other people, you know, reproducing other people's work and stuff. So what's it been like, uh, when you know, in that sort of area as, uh, you know, going to markets, uh, not markets, but fairs and stuff like that? events it, conventions like you know you went um, you did yeah <laughs> it's complicated so depending on the purpose of the artwork and mm. whether there is benefit made or not the rules actually change so we've right. had everything from um there's a festival called the beach hop which is a car festival down south mm. um in fungal matar each year and when we paint for them sometimes it's images like for example when um, we applied to paint Betty Boop. Um, we had to hire the use of her image to be painted for to be reproduced for a caravan door once. And that was it was a fee of about five hundred dollars to paint her to pay for all the royalties to do that because yeah. the caravan was being sold for profit. Um, right. So that meant that they had to essentially apply to the owner to buy the license or whatever about 500 
is what I've come across for most of the places like Getty Images as well to do them for public show or reproduction. Mm. So you can certainly buy the rights if you like, but it is expensive. Um, yeah. We do a lot of live shows though, and we're a registered yeah. charity yeah. for students. And in New Zealand, the copyright law, I, I can't legally say does not apply, <laughs> but there is a roundabout way where if you were painting it for practice, not for profit or just demonstration or hobby, and there's no money being traded on parts, then you are allowed to paint that painting in public. You are not allowed to sell it. You're not allowed to reproduce it and then sell laminated copies of it. So right. that's essentially if you're doing it for a live demo or display. So quite often when you see our team painting a car at an event, some of those images technically are copyrighted, but we're doing them as a live demonstration. There's no money handed over. Um, yeah. And then at the end of it, if we do get any um, donations through for our charity, they go to the Angel Baby Castings. But otherwise, you must apply for... Um, licenses for copyright law because I know a lot of people believe the old the old thing of the change it by was at 10 percent I think and it's non-applicable yeah. and that is not true that is yeah. not true at all in New Zealand it comes down to a likeness it makes it a very gray law because we used to have employment lawyers and trademark lawyers that would go through this with us if they can yeah. take you to court and argue that you have based your design off their design, you can get done for it. Mm. In regards to somewhere like Marvel, though, or Disney, they would have to take you to court in the country where the crime is committed. So they would have to launch a case against you in New Zealand. So that is the law. Practice, demonstration, or study. If you sell it, you have to give them a cut preferably beforehand. <laughs> yeah. And if you're actually going to sell it and put a price tag on it, play it safe and pay that fee to Getty Images or to Warner Brothers or whoever. I know it's a lot, but yeah. um, at the end of it, you know, it keeps you out of a whole lot of legal trouble. Um, so that's that's the basics of the copyright law. Um, but yeah, anything to say? Agree, disagree? <laughs> Guys? <laughs> well, that's pretty much how it works. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, learned it's all always... this too. Sorry. Oh, Kira. Oh, I was saying I learned all this too by making an artist accident. And that was 10 years ago when I was learning to airbrush. I found this amazing photo of a shark online and someone had removed right. all the watermarks and copyrights and I don't know who it belonged uh -huh. to and it was on a free wallpaper site. So I thought I'll paint that and I'll sell it. So I painted it, put a price tag on it and then someone tagged the photographer in it and it turns out he was a photographer for National Geographic. Right. And so he was not impressed and wanted 50% of the sale and the gallery wanted 52% of the sale. And I sat there going, I'm 102% down before I sell this thing now. So yeah. um, it, it pays to, but then again, sometimes if you find an artwork or fan art, especially, or a picture you want to do and you approach the artist, most of the time they say, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I mean, it's like me, like, I mean, I, I don't mind anybody doing this at all. I have no problem, right? I have no problem anybody out there doing fan work for Incredible because it's my my property. So if somebody says, oh, yeah, what, you know, if I someday go, well, yeah, I didn't give you, right, okay. You know, as long as you don't, you know, you're not out there, like, trying to, like, sell it as your, your you know, your character or you're trying to, like, make something, you know, uh, something, like, R-rated, right? This is an all ages thing. So if you're not trying to like abuse the idea behind the character, I'm happy with that. Yeah. I think that the problem I this is sometimes like it disgusts me sometimes, to be honest. Like when I see children, like things made for kids being adulterated, like uh, I, you know, like um, and I've I've seen it, you know, like I think, you know, you, you get something like. 
curtsy, like you know, like and it's put put into like a adult uh, pose or adult clothes. You know, it's it's kind of like takes the innocence away of the actual, you know. So because yeah. it's, um, because I come from a background of like comics, where I believe that there's an age, you know, age to what a person should be reading, and what content they should be uh, at what age. Um, so I will I will label the ratings on those comics. So like when we were do, putting out in Kurtigo, right? So because this is our only all ages comic book, I couldn't put any of our other comics advertising behind it because the other comic or or mature readers so i you know said like we can't we can't advertise yeah. anything else because it's for kids like anybody like you know 13 12 year olds can read it and i think what we've oh, you know um a lot of times we see stuff like mickey and donald and you know some like some of the more more innocent characters being um being uh you know being put in a art creation being put into something else like you could do with ai right now like you go this you put this in and this in and this in it'll spew out this adult content based off these kids you know um uh, uh not merch but uh, kids um products you know and i think that's the harmful side of that i've seen in ai is that you can put people real people into the situations that you never oh, actually scary. Yeah, and I and I've seen that happen, and I, I like sorry, I've I've had news things about that happen where people have faked, deep fake people's faces onto other people's faces, oh, right? And it's that. like, oh, I know, and I think this is this is where I, like with back to AI, you know AI. I think we sort of it's better to err on the side of caution as much as possible. I think, and that's the same thing with copyright, right? You want to err on the side of caution because you don't want to put open yourself up to lawsuits because. At the end of the day, you don't want to be the one who goes broke because you did one little picture. You know? No, and usually they've got more money than you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so air on the side of caution, 100%. <laughs> yeah. Now, have you, have you had any of your work being reproduced by other people? No. Oh, um, kind of. Not, not mass reproduced, but... I've caught out a few plagiarisms and things like that. So it started in the days of, oh, my gosh, even before Facebook, I can't – maybe, like, was it MySpace or when you had those little chat logos? Yeah. Some, like, back then, and you had your little chat avatar and my yeah, artwork yeah. Was up. So that was when it started happening. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly people using it for logos or avatars. I've had a couple of people plagiarize my work and claim it's theirs. Um, yeah. And I've had some coincidences where I can't prove it's based off mine, but it's a really common concept. That one's really yeah. hard as well. Um, and I think the biggest one we came across was it was a complete scam. And right. it was an image of one of my paintings got turned into a product and because i saw it was a product i clicked on it and it turned out to be a uh, virus from russia or something so yeah. it was a, tro a trojan i had a trojan yeah. yeah with with my face on it like me standing next to a painting basically so wow. that's how i had my art stolen i know i was like i'm a virus in russia neat <laughs> Um, it's been for um, deceiving benefits. Oh, apart from the time it was literally stolen from a house during a robbery, right. but that that was another story. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's. I mean, we we. I mean, we live in a social media world, right? Where we share all our work. I mean, like all our stuff is on Plunge Studios, right? I'll share because I'm trying to create a. Um, a publicity, you know, um, for my work, for our work, so that my artists can showcase, be showcasing their work. We can show, we can build up a, um, I guess, customer base or a fan base for what we are creating. And so you're putting out pages out there, but there's, you know, there's also the fact that this is all going to get chewed up into AI anyway. Everything that we've ever put out, you know, so you can try to like say, no, nah, you can hold off, but it's a how do you balance, you know, knowing that anybody can take your work 
against right. and it's, we're it's trying to really make a living. Hard. It used to be that you just didn't upload a high resolution image and you put a watermark on it and you were fine. And yeah. Technology has just wiped that out the window now. Like you can take yeah. the lowest resolution picture with a watermark and run it through AI, and it increases yeah. the resolution, resolution and removes removes the watermark. So, yeah. what do you do? But but then I mean I I quite like fan art. I like the concept of fan art and how yeah. you know how giving and and free it is. <laughs> yeah. So you guys I can't um, like you do a your exhibition or your your convention i was going to get to that but like with um with your with your artwork you do a lot of pop culture style uh themes like uh poses and like i mean uh, what was that recent one i saw of yours um uh, i mean you did it like an iron man a while back and stuff like that so yeah. Are, are those like custom works that you do or um are you just doing that like a lot of work do you do like you've got that one at the back there as a custom piece, but how, um, what percentage of your work is actually custom, you know, um, special cons convention, um, commissions compared to what uh, you just 90%, do for yourself? 90% is custom work and commissions. We actually specifically took a year off this year to study so we could explore our own avenues a bit more um, <laughs> because your life gets so consumed with, commission work and doing work for other people that you can almost like you know there's things you miss out on learning that are within mm. your your style that you like so so Zoe and I yeah just took a year to to paint for ourselves mm. <laughs> yeah so this is um Chris Tiger Harris here says right anyone can save your images on this pc or phone and claim it's theirs that's definitely the danger of it definitely the danger of it and yeah, yeah, I think and um, they do. you know, right. And I think um, that's what I find like uh, for people who actually work in the anime style, like like the manga style, because that's a very and also um, animation style, right? Like cartoon style, because yeah. it's so stylized work, uh, especially because it's not photo real. It's not. Um, it's not particular. You know doesn't have the brush strokes as such as you would have as a traditional artist. Like you can say, this is how, you know, the lines went with my work because it's the digital um, format of that. I think it makes anybody can claim it. And I think, um, you know, they can, and it comes down to you as an artist to decide, am I going to chase this person or am I going to leave it? Um, yeah. Some artists will chase that person. Some will leave it. The nice way to go about it when I do have an issue and it's happened is I send them a simple message and go, hey, this is actually my image. What is yep. it doing on your website, please? And, well, they usually take it down pretty quick and in you, my experience. Yeah. Yeah, you just post it anyway, in my opinion, because anyone can download an image and anyone can take a photo of your artwork if it's on a wall. There's no point chasing yep. down every single person if you can't them you catch them if you don't you don't well to yeah. this the other side of that and and i don't mean to disrespect any artists that are really like active in trademarking and copywriting their work because we do as well but how far does it go what am i going to do stop people taking photos at events because yeah. they've now got the high resolution images well their cameras are better than mine um if i ask them they send me the photo which is lovely so um, yeah. I think there's a certain amount of humanity that has to come into this as well. But I, yeah. I really can't think of any way, unfortunately, to stop people from stealing images or art. Just take progress photos as you go. And then yeah. if it does end up going anywhere, you can at least show progress photos. But other yeah. than that, I'm no help. I'm sorry. Yeah, the reality is everything gets stolen. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I had, I had a, um, I had a logo stolen from us, uh, which was this, all right? Yeah. So this double F, the double, uh, here, the double yeah. F. So that was stolen around about two thousand six or five, uh, two thousand six, two thousand seven, 
And yeah. um, I spent months coming up with that logo while I was learning how to be a business, you know, do a small business course. I just sat there coming up with this artwork and, uh, you know, doing the course and just, I've got, you know, like I've got a pad which has got all the, like, you know, all the little things I changed and why I changed it and what it was supposed to be yeah. like. And we got, to, I remember because we'd put, I put up a clothing, clothing line with it on it. And um, it was called Forgiven Clothing. And I'd went, you know, I've, I went away to film school and sold sold what we had off the, of the manufactured clothing, T-shirts, yeah. hats and everything. And I came back to Auckland and because I'd been down South Island and I came back to Auckland and someone who had been on the TV show said, hey, were you, did you take part in the TV show as well? I said, what do you mean? Um, that. I go, no, no, this is my hat. That's my logo. Right, this is the label that's on my clothing, you know. And he goes, No, no, I was, I was like, What? So I looked into the um, IP laws in New Zealand and the, um, I rang up a lawyer and it said, Well, you need 10k, yeah, you know. So, what is your trademark? You know, yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to come with 10k to go go to court with it. And I was like, Dude, I, I've just started doing stuff work, I've just come out of um, you know, school. Um, well, you know, yep. do my bachelor's course, and I got you know. So I just thought, you know what? I've got all this, all this years of stuff. I've got a, jet, I've got a, um, I've got a, I've got a cap in the cupboard. I have a hoodie in the, you know, and um, hanging there, and it's got my logo with a label, you know, and uh, printed everything. When it, you know, I'm so I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to put up my superhero with the logo on it, you know. We got plans for all this, and when when they come, I say, well, you know, let's see <laughs> who created first and how did it come to be, and yeah. you know, and and That's at the right. end of the day, I don't, I've got Crying nothing to prove. Does count. Yeah. So yeah. you and know, at the end of the day, it's like if they're gonna if they end up taking something and claiming it's theirs, it's them their place to prove it that, that it's they came up with it originally, and the fact is. They have more money involved in their product than I have in mine, you know. Yeah, and I think, and that's right. If not trademark, you can argue prior use, but it becomes yep. a whole, a whole thing. Um, we recently discovered there's another place up here using our acronym that we came up with, and it's mm. like, uh, but do we bother? We looked at looked at them. They're actually another community place, and they're doing really great in the community in Northland yep. and. And the first part of our name starts with Northland. So the fact that yeah. someone else is going to come up with our acronym is quite yeah. high. You know, is it worth your time chasing them down the street? Oh, sometimes yeah. we're just inspired by the same things and massive coincidences happen. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. So um, well, wait for setting some comics. <laughs> there, is, there is the other side of where people want to take shortcuts rather than spend the time building something. I think um, a lot of times with comics, I was like that, you know, like you just take an idea and you go, oh, it's my idea, it's not down. And I usually, when, yeah. I, when I'm talking to friends who come, you know, who come to me about ideas, I go, don't tell me your idea. You know, trademark yeah. it, put it down. Don't even tell me what the story is about. I don't want to know what your character does. Yeah. I Because somewhere along the line, I might come up with a similar character and you will come back to me and tell me, it's, you know, remember the time I told you that idea, you know, about yeah. this? I'm like, yeah. I mean, I've got a friend who, like, I'll, I'll say something to him and he'll, go, he'll give me this. He'll give say, nah. You know, thank you, but no, I'm not going to take any of that because when I create, it's got to be 100% mine. Otherwise, someone will always yeah. say, I had, a, I had a foot in that. You know, I had, a, I had a hand in creation on that. And then they might come back and go, I want a piece of it now. That now it's great or now it's done well. And, you know, but yeah. they don't. You know, a lot of people, you know, the shortcut and um, is, is an easier path for them to take because they don't want to do the hard work and uh, they don't see the work it takes to build something. And I think... Yeah, um, I think that's you know, it. It takes years and decades to build something large enough like, yeah. and it's, you know, we're still small in regards to business, but I suppose yeah. I look at the the avatars or the acronyms that are taken or whatever, or anyone that might be trying to take shortcuts. And and if you know business well, you know they're not going to last long writing off shortcuts. Yeah. 
it's yeah. yeah people people figure it out you're better off yeah. like focusing on your work and just keep moving forwards because well i suppose you know it's it's not right but gosh i mean i remember when i started face painting we all we were all like do you want to be spider-man <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're totally stealing that design you know we know yeah. it. what am i going to do do you want to be spider person with red yeah. it's uh, yeah i mean you can't stop a kid from not having spider-man right like i mean that's one thing that like i, I really think um when you get to a stage when you're trying to protect something that's so so um you know in the mainstream right like yeah. i can just hold up a dvd right that's so everywhere it's a global thing you can't and not tell kids you know or, or batman right you can't tell kids not to you know have that on themselves especially when their parents, <laughs> have, when their parents have bought freaking toys right <laughs> for them yeah it's interesting too because face painters sometimes use stencils as well and yeah. the stencil mask that they buy will be like bat boy or web blaster man um yeah. just try and avoid that copyright it's quite hilarious but fair yeah. enough i suppose <laughs> yeah i mean like it's when you sell like multi-billion dollars worth of product and you, to get people to buy you know buy more of that product but and then you want to go and say you to a child you can't have that on your gravestone it seems a bit insidious oh. and evil you know yeah that's and i'm talking really about disney with, uh, with with a little boy with his spider-man friend you know died young i think he died of cancer or leukemia and they couldn't let him you know couldn't let the parents give him a uh, spider-man gravestone and they had to get taken away it's like you kind of think like how many how many more billion dollars do you need you know yeah. to you know to not let a kid who's passed on actually have That's a marker you know? yeah and i think like i mean i could never imagine that like you know someone taking you know taking a character girl and saying oh i love this character so much my daughter or my son you know enjoyed it so much uh we want to put that out there i'm like Do you yeah. need to ask me? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's such a, a, like, that's the greatest homage in the world you can have for something, you know. And the, the fact is that, you know, it's like, it's such a, it's something you imagined, right? You came up with in your head and you got out there to a place where someone would care so much about that character, they would they'd want yeah. that on there. And I think that's, that disconnect, I think, that also that comes part of this is like the whole mass manufacturing of stuff where it goes beyond just um, being something enjoyable to just being a dollar sign, you know? Yeah, and the, the mega corporations, I understand and respect, they are, they are protecting what they spent years building in their intellectual yeah. property. But then again, you know, the fan art and things like that has a certain amount of humanity to it. So... Right. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, do you trade your humanity for money? You gotta pick and choose what you fight over, really. I had a similar yeah. situation yeah. where uh, the lady who bought my demon painting, she's gonna get it tattooed, she said. Yeah, and I'm right. totally cool with that. I don't mind if the tattooist uses mm. that in their portfolio or as their tattooing, because to me, mm. that's a huge honor. And they're still having to recreate that image and use their own art skills to create that image yeah, on skin, right. which is something I couldn't do anyway. So I'm completely mm -hmm. fine with that. So these mega corporations are just, yeah. And so we brought up crazy. a really good point because she's sort of like my apprentice and still learning as she goes. And when the lady yeah. wanted her artwork tattooed after buying the original, mum, uh, Zoe was like, Mum, do I charge her again for the use of the image on a tattoo? Is that still my mm. image? Or yeah. does the tattooist get to use it again? What is this really opening up yeah. here? You know, does that photo go on the website and their tattooist get the credit for Zoe's design? Yeah, I told right. her it's one time use. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. I think that's, but they, they can use it as. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, uh, that's something that I was thinking about that as well. So, like, uh, with the tattoos especially. So, there was a big, huge issue with um, – oh, gosh, I can't remember his name now. Is a WWE um, WWE uh, superstar, like wrestling superstar. Uh, gosh, I can't remember his name. But he's called the Snake or something. Like, not the you – no, know, Jake's the Snake or something like that, but, like, a, a newer guy, but he's, like – does a cobra thing but he had all these tattoos the lady who had done these tattoos so they made sleeves uh wwe had done sleeves to sell right as like that you could buy as clothing you know like you know the sock sleeves or whatever and she basically said that they couldn't do that because it was her artwork on his body that she'd come up with and so yeah. they had for ages they had to cover it on toys they had to cover it on um on the games and stuff until they worked out something mm -hmm. but you know it's like a lot of work now that is done like um traditionally like you, you could get like a you know you could basically get a joker tattoo now right so yeah do you get do you get someone to actually do an original joker art and then go yeah now you can do that because now you're yeah. paying the artist you know or you're just going to take it off uh, yeah. already somebody else's work because that way at least somebody yeah. gets paid who comes up with the artwork or do you pay the yeah. original artist for it yeah or do you pay universal studios plus the tattooist plus whoever yeah. else and and right. a lot of the time too because we design tattoos people will say to us oh can you design my tattoo and then they take it to the tattooist the tattooist is always going to change and balance that to fit your body and their style yeah. because it's their work they're probably better off just going to the tattooist in the first place yeah. but um there's they say no exactly like that and the thing is is not everything fits the same way yeah. or the tattooist might not be willing to put their name to that design there's there's all mm. sorts that can happen it's um yeah yeah apparently it's, i have the led zeppelin angel on my back and i didn't know for about six years until someone pointed it out for me because to me yeah. it was just an angel i found in a book an androgynous one with like cloth around his waist and yeah. um, couldn't figure out why people were going yeah led zeppelin <laughs> <laughs> so that must have been yeah. from somewhere as well so i don't know man yeah, I think th there's the thing with art, isn't it? Like, it's so much of it out there as well. And I think sometimes coming up with original work is always going to be the human thing, isn't it? Like, only humans will come up with something original. And I think yeah. that's the that's something that we as, you know, God's creatures, whatever, you know, can come up because we think we we communicate with each other. We're able to see things in a different way. And individually, you know, we can see things individually and we can yeah. see the same thing, yet produce it in a different way, you know, and yeah. uh, be witness to the same plant or the flower, yet we'll draw it differently. Yet, if you do that to AI, it'll be the same thing. You know, if yeah. you do that to the computer, it'd be exactly the same thing produced, exactly the same way, just with a slight different touch to it. But unlike us, we'll, you know, we'll do 10 different versions of it uh until we get the one that we are happy with and i think that's what our i think that's the where education comes in as like with art teachers right where you guys can sit down with a student who's got a particular art style and yet they're able to keep working at it and change and change and change until you get the final version and go this is what i'm happy with and this is what i will work with now I think that's Correct. a great yeah. thing about actually going to schools like yourselves, you know, like you know, taking courses where you have someone not trying to put out a cookie cutter artist, right? Uh, but actually putting out creatives. And I think that's a great thing about um, places like yourselves that actually do creative as the main yeah. thing rather than, you know, rather than like A, B, C, D, you know, because I know we don't. You know, artists do not work A, B, C, D, you know, like when I'm writing a story, I'm writing like X and then I'll come back to B and then I'll float around to, you know, Z and maybe I'll, you know, and the same thing, you know, you don't start, yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't start where you finish up. And I think um, 
I think, you know, you guys know more about that than I do. Do you want to talk about that aspect of it? The actual process of, um, you know, um, working with kids at different levels of art and also working within what their, um, their style is compared to what you guys are, you know, as teachers have already, you know, have your own style is. Yeah, so um, in my teaching, um, or what was it, a certificate through the Open Polytech that I did, it was all about, first of all, identifying different types of learners. There's five different types of learners, um, or so we think, um, and if you can kind of fit people into one of those learning brackets, it can aid you and assist you in being able to teach that person. Now, the typical school system, like back in the, certainly the 1990s when I was there, really only um, accounted for uh, for some of the students. All of your neuro Sorry, guys. Looks like we um we had a drop. Hello. Apologies. Yep. Uh, looks like he might have disconnected. It's just us. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. It's just like I I, I just wanted to put I put this up and it just sort of disconnected you. So remember how I was telling oh. you about the tattoos. So it's Randy Orton. So right. um so um or something because of his tattoos and WWE video game, and she got mad. Oh, that's, that's who it was. Yes, that's yeah. right. Oh man. Oh. Yeah. So, so long story short, first we assess what type of learner the person is through trying different um, delivery techniques. If we can refine what type of learner that child is, that we can use techniques that are more suited to them. But we never go. This is what you're going to paint. This is your pass mark. They tell us what they like, and we give them options of what they can do. And then based on the options of what they can do, they can choose the path for their own art because we're never going to go, that's not how a leaf is painted. We're going to go, look, if if you want to do it with pencils or your thumbs or that KFC teaspoon, if that works for you and that's your style, then great. So we're just there to offer the tools and um, bail them out of things in their style if it goes a bit pear-shaped. Yeah, we offer what we know and then we let them develop on their own skills and interests and ideas. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Gosh, I, that's interesting about the tattoos being pulled up on them, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. For the video. yeah. I think, yeah. Thanks, Chris, for that. I really appreciate that. I mean, like, so it's, you know, I mean, like, there's so much. Oh, Chris, hi, yeah. Chris. Sorry, I just realized who he was. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. So, what age group do you guys have come to the um, to the school? Do you want to start with your age group? Um. So I teach nine to thirteen year olds. Right. Um. Which are very beginner artists, and I try and teach them what I learnt and what I wish I knew, grow up growing up and drawing the kind of stuff they drew. Because I remember when I was younger, starting digital art and anime and cartoon and all this stuff that they're interested in there was nearly nothing and yeah. it was it was quite difficult because there was a really limited number of sources of information so now i offer what i know and i encourage them to also look online and other places because there's mm. a huge amount of information that they could learn from there that will better their art and it's up to them to decide what to listen to and what they like and what they don't like. And that's how mm. it develops. And try other art classes. Yeah. That's a huge thing. Like quite often people are like, oh, we're sorry we're leaving you. It's just, it's like, go, go and experience the world, you know, the, the, yeah. Yeah. come back. Just collect that's, as much knowledge as you can. That's it. That's exactly it. So she does nine to 13. Yeah. And then there's a gap where we both do, which is about 13 to 20. And those are mostly the respite and teenage students struggling with mental health or the special needs. Yeah. Um, and then I teach the adults. Um, so from again, probably that kind of 13, 14 gap um, mm. through to my oldest student is oh, in her 80s, I think. Yeah, Possibly. most of mine are older than me. It's quite cool. 
<laughs> yeah, it's so that people, you know, there is. I think when you get to older age, you got more time, but you also want are more willing to learn as well. Because I think when you're younger, you kind of like think I know it all. I know, I know, I did that when I was younger, yeah. and you know, sometimes I still think that I know it all. But I think I'm more teachable now than I used to be. And I think the older you get, the more you realize yeah, that you don't know it. <laughs> the older people are seizing opportunities. They have lived yeah. their lives mostly, maybe, and um, they're mm -hmm. looking back and going, gosh, I wish I could have. And the answer is, well, why don't you? Yeah. You know, it's um, so we get quite a few yeah. that that come in just because it's something they always looked at doing and you don't often come across airbrush lessons especially so when they mm. pop up i mean when opportunity knocks if you can take it yeah well yeah. um is there anything else you want to talk about as we finish off here or that you want to like promote i know you guys are coming to um i know um julia you're coming to the Kerry Curry Plunge Convention, and we're going to have, you know, selling art and stuff there. And I encourage everybody else. Yeah. I encourage everybody. Who's, yeah. I'm, I'm encourage everybody who's, <laughs> I encourage and, everybody who's in the far north and northland to actually check out the Facebook page, Plunge Convention, uh, and look at what we got coming up in Kerry, go 16th of September, and uh, have a look at, um, you know, if you want a stall there to sell your artwork, just like Julia and you know, get out yeah. there, uh, inspire other people. Uh, now, yeah, I'm going to let you say your piece, Julia. And so oh, that's, I was just saying how excited I am to being there and uh, for being there because our last one we did was really cool. I love doing the airbrush tattoos and and all that st sort of stuff. Um, Zoe and I, I'm briefly going to selfishly plug ourselves for a second. We have right, um, your... one sec. Yep. Did you change the there settings? You. Hello. <laughs> it's Julia and Zoe here from Northland Art Centre Charitable Trust. Um, we're actually holding two exhibitions this month. Um, one is a walk-in viewing exhibition at Highlight, and that starts on Friday the 18th of, um, when is it, August? Friday the 18th of August. Yeah. Um, that is the hydroponic shop. Um, they've asked us to hang a few pieces. And that is a pre-exhibition for one on Saturday the 1st of September, which is Zoe's and my graduation party. Uh, we're graduating level six in arts and uh, creativity. Um, and it's gonna be a pretty neat event. So we'll send an invite out through Aru and um, and we'd love to see some of you guys there. It's gonna be 116. Excellent, yeah. a good venue. It's yes, yes. I'm glad we we fell on that in the end. Uh, light light drinks and light snacks provided. All right, um, Zoe, did you want to say awesome. anything else? Um, ooh, hello. Not currently, <laughs> hello, I'm Zoe. Um, feel free to check me out at Zeke Rose Arts NZ on Facebook. I'm currently starting up my own saw the brand and i'm currently doing pinups and i'm awesome. going to be releasing prints and products at custom some custom pinups so if you yep. want to be painted as a pinup that's your lady yep. and i do traditional and digital awesome might have to hit you up for a cover sometime so thank you guys <laughs> uh make sure to check it out northland art center is it still called northland art center yeah still northland art center yep, yep. they can they can and... be suggesting yeah, or my personal page julia tap i don't mind and awesome. um, yeah, it's going to be good. And we'll have a go as well at um, your Incredit Girl as well, I think. Let's do our own fan awesome. art. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I mean, more fan art, the better. I think it's just, you know, it's just. Maybe we can do a body paint nothing. at your event of Incredit Girl. Find me a model. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I'm sure somebody's going to put their hand up to try it out. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out here on a Sunday. Um, wherever you guys all are, um, I just uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for um, providing information. I really enjoyed that, um, getting um, Randy Orton there and actually, you know, talking about art as well and um, the digital thing. I know sometimes, like, uh, you know, you you know, you might think that we're all fearful of AI, but there is a reason why we are and then also a reason why we're not.
because sometimes it can be a helping hand to it, well as artists and creatives but but you know you got to you got to bring a balance to this and whatever wherever you're you know wherever you fall on the you know on the subject it's your choice to fall on that subject and own it you know don't try to fight with people who don't agree with it and don't fight with you know don't fight against people who do agree with it just do your thing and you know um at the end of the day don't steal art <laughs> you know that's all that every that's right. artist yeah. wants is don't don't steal our art you know don't steal our yep. um, things that we've spent so much time creating and because people have spent decades honing their skills right everybody has spent decades honing their skill me as a writer i've spent about probably five years honing my skill as a writer you know and i've uh, spent time and money doing that and you know you guys both have just gone to school to learn to be better teachers and you know do run what you're doing better and provide a better um, opportunities for people in the community of all ages and it's just so cool we didn't talk a lot about the respite and what that is uh, but thank you and i'm sure you guys can find out more by actually getting contact with julia like she said on facebook and uh, if you missed out at the start of this uh interview or anything like that or this discussion check it out it's on plunge cast on youtube one word plunge cast check out all the other interviews we've done we we just love uh, i just personally love promoting other people it's just and just talking with people and artists because i get to learn stuff i get to learn about them and i get to uh promote them because it's just growing the community growing uh, people doing great work in the community and like i said we got our what we did got started with plunge right at the opening of a uh, northern artist center with julia and uh you know if we didn't have that beautiful event happen we might not have met hindu who was uh who was the general manager at the time of creative northern with both yeah. me and her together we would not be where we are right now you know, we could have been somewhere yeah, else but amazing. yeah and it's just you know we've had so much help along the way so we want that's why i want to keep helping other people get ahead as well because we're not an island you know as people we're humans we're sociable creatures and wherever you are grow your community share your love for art and uh you know be well be safe we'll catch you next time like i said check out julia taps on facebook and uh, tap and uh we'll see you next broadcast i think next week we've got a horror comic writer from the uk lucifer storm he's got a few comics out there and i'm just excited to have him join us next week i think it might be early around about 10 o'clock but thank you so much guys see you next time Kaki down all